Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you today. My name is Aaron, and I'm happy to share God's word with you. This is my first sermon for this new school year. Now, I remember what it was like to start a new school year. It was exciting, um, but I was actually feeling a little bit alone. I don't know if you can relate to this, but after coming from a summer of retreats and hanging out with my church friends, I felt alone in the world, and I longed for a sense of community with my friends and fellowship with God and the power and the presence of Jesus in my life. And unfortunately, this feeling doesn't go away as you get older. It's difficult being a Christian in the world. Uh, didn't God say that he would never leave us or forsake us? Our passage presents some help for us today. And these are the leading moments before Jesus' betrayal. He's speaking to his disciples, and they're distraught. They're worried that Jesus is going to leave them alone in this world. I want you to take out your Bibles and take out a pen and some paper. Our passage today is John 14, 15 to 26. And so to calm the concerns of Jesus' disciples, Jesus is going to give three definitive declarations. They're sweeping statements about the gift of the Holy Spirit. They're staggering. And my goal is to help you see these breathtaking claims and how they apply to us today. We actually have the same question that the disciples were asking when Jesus was with them. And the question is this, how can we obey when Jesus is away? How can we obey when Jesus is away? The first point for our passage today is promise, promise. So write that down, number one. The first point today is the promise. And I get this from verses 15 to 17. Here it is on the screen. I want you to read with me, John 14, 15 to 16. And then whenever you see a line, that means that underneath the line, those are cross-references. So I'm going to be referring to those verses as well. But let's read this one. John 14, 15 to 16, the promise. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So this is Jesus speaking, and the first declaration is a promise. Jesus framed his promise with love and keeping his commandments. Now, this is, not a new, this is not a new concept to the disciples. They know that God always required this of his people, that they would listen and obey the Lord. And Jesus demands this for his followers as well, preparing them for when he leaves. Now, what does it mean to keep Christ's commandments? It means to watch and to guard, to obey, and to observe. Now, this is easier said than done. Back in John chapter 13, Jesus had a new commandment for his disciples, that they would love one another, and they would love like Jesus did, humbly, sacrificially, giving of themselves, and following in Christ's footsteps. They were even to love their enemies. Now, Jesus knows that this is actually impossible without God's help. We must remember that the disciples were still sinners. They were unfaithful, deserting, and denying Jesus when it came down to it. What Jesus does is he promises a helper, a helper to be with us forever, someone who will help us keep Christ's commandments. This concept of the helper is further explained later in John. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He will bear witness about me. What the Spirit does is that he helps bear witness about Jesus. He testifies, he commends, he speaks well of and vouches for Christ. He comes alongside to advocate for Jesus. He's called to comfort and encourage us as believers. We're promised a helper who will always tell us about Jesus Christ 
And we see more of this back in John 14. It says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. This helper is the spirit of truth, meaning the totality and ultimate reality of God. That, that's the truth, the totality and the ultimate reality of God. The spirit of truth is again mentioned in John 16. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of truth will guide the disciples into all the truth. Now remember, at this point in time, Jesus did not yet die on the cross and resurrect. So the full picture of salvation and God's plan and the kingdom inauguration, it had not yet been fully realized. There was still a lot for the disciples to see. And there were books of the Bible that had not even been written yet. For the disciples, this was a promise directly related to writing God's word. The spirit of truth would speak into scripture. It will come from the authority of God who can declare the things that are to come. And this spirit of truth would guide their actions and dictate the course of their life as they would demonstrate their love for Jesus and his truth by witnessing to the world, evangelizing, and even dying as martyrs with hearts that truly love the Lord. Now, of course, the biblical canon is actually closed for us today. There's no more books of the Bible that are to be written. So how are we right now going to apply this scripture? Because not many of us are challenged to be martyrs. How does this apply for us today? Well, we do believe that the spirit of truth continues to speak to us. And we do believe that the spirit of truth continues to guide us in God's word, let's look at this, this verse in 1 Corinthians. This will help us apply God's promise to us today. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. By guiding us into truth, the Spirit helps us understand and interpret and accept the things of God. We need to see that without the help of the Spirit, people will not understand or accept the gospel. Believing in God is a supernatural ability. We cannot get mad when others don't accept the gospel or believe God's word, uh, but we must pray for them. And when persecution eventually comes, we will be ready to face it by believing in God's promises. We will be ready to risk it all for the cause of Christ. Jesus promises the spirit as a helper who will bear witness about Jesus, guiding us as we come to understand and accept the truth of God's word. The second point that I have for us today is the presence, the presence of God. So write that down. Point number two is the presence of God. This is Jesus' second declaration to his disciples. Jesus offers us the presence of God. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. Jesus takes us back to the big issue. The disciples are afraid. 
that Jesus is going to leave them alone. Um, Jesus hints that he will appear to them after his resurrection. He says that he will come to them and he will actually be with them. They will physically see him and it will assure them that because he lives, they also will live. This resurrection assurance is also found in Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Back to our main passage. We have a question from Judas. Judas, not Iscariot. Now, Judas Iscariot had already been dismissed by Jesus to go and betray him. I believe that the passage tells us directly that it's Judas, not Iscariot. It's Judas, not Iscariot, for a couple reasons. First, we have to remember that Jesus is talking to his real disciples here. They're the real, true, faithful disciples. And we're reminded that the promise and God's presence is for true followers of Jesus Christ. And I also think that we're to see that this is a genuine question. It's, it's a genuine question that Judas, not Iscariot, has for Jesus. Genuine believers want to know and understand what God is saying. Well, let's see what he asks here. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answers him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we will make our home with him. We're going to make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. God, the father, Jesus, the son, and the spirit are going to come and they're going to make their home in those who truly love Jesus. Now, this is unprecedented. God had slowly been revealing that he will make himself known, that he will even be amongst his people. But to actually have the presence of God living with you, dwelling with you, rooming with you, it's, it's unheard of. It's incredible. Hear how this concept plays out in 2 Corinthians where if the spirit dwells in individual believers, he also has a prominent place of authority in the church. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. It's talking about true Israel. It's talking about the church. What does it mean to have the presence of God in your life today? It means at least this. It means that no matter where you go, God is always with you. You can never be far away from his truth and from his reality. Is this not what God's presence means? It means that he's with you. You're aware of his being with you. You're aware of his presence. You're aware of his existence. You're aware that he is here with you. And for believers, God's presence directly corresponds to what we know about him because it's what he's revealed to us in his word. He's made himself known in his truth. We've heard it. And in 1 John, we're told that we must let God's truth actually abide in us. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. That is a picture of God's presence inside of you and you dwelling with God. What you heard from the beginning is namely the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, conquering sin and death. Let this truth abide in you. Do you live with this reality? Do you live with this perspective? Do you live with this attitude? We cannot go about our lives living as if God does not exist. Unbelievers, unbelievers suppress the truth of God. But true believers, true Christians, those of us who love Jesus, we see the world through the lens of scripture. 
and we live our lives as if God is really inside of us, that he's actually amongst us, that we actually are the salt and light in this world. We live our lives accordance to the resurrected Christ, our King. The presence of God is given to believers as we allow God's word to abide in us. The third point and our final point today is power. This is the third declaration that Jesus gives to his disciples before he leaves. It's the power of God. Now, I'm using this term power very purposefully here. The Spirit really is God, and his power is supernatural power. I'm not talking about physical strength that we conjure up ourselves. I'm talking about power that God gives to us. It's holy supernatural power from God. We've been talking about the Spirit this entire time, but this is the first time in our passage where Jesus actually says that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. It's crucial to understand that the Holy Spirit is God. He's part of the triune Godhead, the Holy Trinity. He's not second string. He's not subordinate or underneath God. All of the power of God is in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And the Apostle Paul places the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all together in this beloved benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do you see how Paul lumps them all together, combines them all together, groups them all together as God blessing his people? The Apostle Paul saw the Holy Spirit as the power of God. Now, when people think of the Spirit's power, they usually think about speaking in tongues or miraculous signs and wonders. But in our passage today, um, this is not what we see. Jesus presents to us a different type of power today, and it's distinctly tied to his word. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Teaching and bringing to our remembrance. This is the power that Jesus says the Holy Spirit gives to us. It's the ability to remember the wisdom and the words of Jesus. This is a special power of the Holy Spirit. This is especially meaningful for me as a preacher because I don't have to rely on my own abilities or giftings to try to persuade you to believe what I'm saying. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, if God is moving you, then you're going to believe what I'm saying. You will feel it as true in your heart and you'll, you'll actually know that it's true. Um, I, I don't need to try too hard to persuade you. Our faith does not rest in the wisdom of men. Uh, our, our, our faith rests in the power of God. And if my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The power of the Holy Spirit is astounding. Do you rely on your own strength to understand the gospel? Do you rely on your own wisdom to understand God's word and for personal growth and sanctification? You don't have to rely on your own abilities to make progress in the faith. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And if the Spirit, um, if the Spirit is inside of you, it's actually better it's actually better to have the Spirit inside of you than if Jesus was actually physically present with you here. 
if, if Jesus was actually sitting down with you here. Listen to what Jesus has to say about actually having the Holy Spirit inside of you. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that Jesus actually goes away. For if Jesus, if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So even Jesus himself, he says, hey, it's good that I go away because physically, physically, I can't not be with you here, but I will send the Holy Spirit and he will live in each one of you inside of your hearts. Jesus is not physically here with us today, but he sent us his spirit. We do not need to rely on our own strength. It's actually to our advantage that Jesus left this world because he does not need to be physically present to teach and to remind us the things of God. Believers have the special power of the Spirit who teaches and brings to remembrance the wisdom and the words of Jesus Christ. Let's review what we learned so far with Jesus and his three declarations to his disciples of promise and presence and power. First, Jesus promises the Spirit as a helper who will bear witness, guiding us along as we come to understand and accept the truth of God's word. Second, the presence, the presence of God is given to believers as we allow his word to abide in us. And third, believers have the special power of the Holy Spirit who teaches us and brings to remembrance the things of God, the wisdom and the words of Jesus. Promise, presence, and power. And when we boil it all down together, keeping in mind the original context of how the disciples were afraid of Jesus leaving them alone in this world, and how Jesus framed his conversation about loving him and keeping his commandments, we're left with this very simple statement. And this is our big idea for today. The Holy Spirit helps believers keep Christ's commands. The Holy Spirit helps believers keep Christ's commands. This is a sure help that shows up with supernatural power. How can believers obey when Christ is away? It's the Holy Spirit who helps us keep Christ's commands. The Holy Spirit helps us love God, love others, and live a life of worship that honors Christ and gives glory to God. Now, it would be wrong for me to lead you in this direction uh, and to think that it's our obedience that earns our salvation. That, oh, if we just obey God's word, then, then we're, we're saved. Uh, that, that's not necessarily true. Even though the Holy Spirit helps us obey, that doesn't necessarily offer anything to our salvation. Our works don't contribute anything to us being saved. We're saved by the sovereign grace of God alone. We're saved from our sin by Jesus' death and resurrection, and we're promised eternal everlasting life with him. But here's where the Holy Spirit comes in. If you actually believe what I'm saying, if you believe this gospel truth, I know that you can't come to that conclusion on your own. It's actually the Holy Spirit that helps guide you there, that actually moves your heart to believe the gospel. These things, or the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The Spirit reveals the truth and the meaning of Christ's death and resurrection. He reveals it to you by opening your eyes to see and by causing your heart to believe. So my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would move in you to believe. If you're not a Christian here today, if you don't yet believe in Jesus, this is my only application for you today after hearing my message. It's that you would pray. It's that you would pray that God would build the bridge, that God would build the bridge between his heart and your heart, that you would come to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit would reveal his truth to you. Even though I'm speaking God's word, 
it takes supernatural power for you to come to understand and actually believe it in your heart. Pray that you would understand the depths and the designs and the purposes and the plans of God and the message of salvation that's offered to us here in Jesus Christ alone. If you genuinely believe this, if, if you believe this in your hearts, you can be sure that you have saving faith. You can have assurance of your salvation. For no one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. For believers, when we look for applications in our passage today, there's actually no explicit commands in Scripture. There, there's actually no explicit commands in our text that says, if you're a Christian, you need to do this. But here's, here's an implicit command for you, something that, that is in the text if you can read it. It's that we store up Scripture. We store up Scripture. Remember, the original context includes the disciples, but the supernatural power still applies to us today. The Holy Spirit will bring God's words to our remembrance, but how will the Holy Spirit help us to remember things that we don't even know in the first place? How will the Holy Spirit cause us to remember things if we have not read the Bible for ourselves or if we don't even know what the Bible says? How are we supposed to remember the things that we haven't even heard? The Holy Spirit can't do that. And so here's the implicit command in our text today is that you are exposed to God's word. With school in session, with school in session, I know that you're super busy with your clubs and your after school activities and your lessons and your practice and your rehearsals, studying, competitions, games, meets. You need to count the cost of where you spend your time. Are you making the most of your days? Are you putting in the work for your future, but failing to prioritize God's word. Practice being a faithful steward. Prepare yourself for when life gets busier. Discipline yourself to do well at your work while staying in the Bible. Soak yourself in scripture. Saturate your mind with the truth of God's word. Study it like your life depends on it because it does. Your eternal life is at stake from preaching, reading, listening to podcasts, however you can get God's word into your life, store it up and have it ready to go. Hide God's word in your heart. It will keep you from straying and it will keep you from sinning. I have stored up your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Another application, another application is that we must stay in step with the Spirit. We must stay in step with the Spirit. Now, this is a very explicit command in other parts of Scripture. Another way of saying staying in step with the Spirit is being led by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, um, walking by the Spirit. People might even call this being sensitive to the Spirit. You're probably familiar with the phrase being filled up by the Spirit. This all just means being controlled. It all just means being controlled by the Spirit. Um, it means living your life in accordance with the Spirit. It's being convicted by the Holy Spirit and keeping up with his prerogatives and his mission. You must be filled with the Spirit in the different spheres of influence in your lives. It's how we can obey Christ no matter the situation or the circumstance. At school, at home, when you're online, when you're with your friends, when you're alone, when you're with your family, even when you're with your enemies, you can obey God and your obedience will prove that you truly love him. You soak yourself in scripture so that you have the heart and the mind of Jesus. And with the spirit inside of you, you can actually use God's word now. You can deploy it, you can execute it, you can take action with the truth that's inside of your heart. So this is how you apply the points of the promise and the presence and the power. You trust God's promise that he will help you. 
You practice his presence through prayer and reading the Bible, and you act on his power by recalling scripture and actually applying it to your life. And in case, in case you object that this sounds like legalism or it sounds like I actually don't care about your heart, it's actually the Holy Spirit who helps you to truly believe and give you hope, resulting in real, unwavering, life-changing conviction. It's not just going through the motions and trying to live a good life, but it's letting the Holy Spirit take hold of your life and letting the Spirit work and control you. Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. I want to get really granular with you, giving you a couple examples of how the Holy Spirit has helped me um, in, in my own life. I'm not perfect, and I definitely struggle. But here are areas where I've found our gracious God to help fortify my faith by trusting in his promise and by experiencing his presence and by living through his power. How can you apply God's presence in your life? How can you apply God's presence in your life when you feel insecure? When you know that you're not the most popular person? When you know that you don't have the social media clout or the presence that you want or the attention that, that you want? How do you apply God's presence into your life? Maybe you're insecure about how you look or about how you act. I want to tell you that you can find safety and security in God's presence. Your maker, your creator, he's with you and he knows you. That's Isaiah 41.10. He's knitted you in your mother's womb. That's Psalm 139.13. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's Psalm 139.14. You are designed with purposeful intention. And you are lavishly loved as God's child. That's First John. Like him. When you reflect the character of Christ, you are demonstrating his beauty and grace. And though our outer bodies are wasting away, you will in heaven have an imperishable body that looks like Jesus. It's radiant and it will help you to enjoy God forever. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So all these verses... As you're living your life, the Holy Spirit will help you recall them and you will be able to apply them to your life. Here's another example. When you fail a test or when you don't get into the college that you want, or really anytime you, 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 you experience some type of failure or disappointment with the way your life is turning out, you can remember that your worth is not in what you can do. While we were still sinners, it's Christ who died for us. That's Romans 5.8. You don't have to work for your worth because your value has already been declared on the cross. You have received the greatest gift of adoption, and God is your Abba Father. That's Romans 8.15. You are infinitely valuable, you are infinitely precious, and you are infinitely loved by God. You can continue to do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. That's Colossians 3.23. And you can say that by the grace of God, I am what I am. I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. That's 1 Corinthians 5.10. And when you do succeed or feel accomplished, you can give all glory to God, counting everything as lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's Philippians 3, 8. Those are just some examples of how you can apply God's word into your life. You pray when you're experiencing hardship or when your heart is troubled. You pray, Holy Spirit, I believe in the promise that Jesus sent you into my life. I believe that you are present here with me. I ask that I would help to feel your presence now. And I pray that I would experience your power, that you would recall scripture into my life, and that I would try to live my life in joy, knowing that you are with me and I am not alone. I'm not going to lie to you. Being a Christian is hard in this world, and it gets difficult as you get older. And after coming back from retreats 
and spending an entire summer with your church friends, you might find yourself with a deep longing for fellowship and for community and for more of God's presence and power in your life. God does promise that he will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus has promised us the Holy Spirit sent from God the Father who helps us keep Christ's commands. His promise, his presence, and his power are ours. All praise goes back to God. There's a story in John chapter 2 about how the Spirit's power was demonstrated when Jesus was raised from the dead. The disciples, they were discouraged. Maybe they forgot about what Jesus had told them, or maybe they just, they just didn't see how it was all playing out when Jesus died. They forgot the plan. Maybe they were just unable to process it. But with the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were actually able to remember and to believe. When therefore he was raised from the dead, when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. They remembered it and they believed it. This is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. They were able to remember and believe. The Holy Spirit helped us remember and brings us to believe in scripture and in Jesus. If you have heard God's word today and you do not harden your heart, you will remember what I said about the promise and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, you will remember this moment. You'll remember what I'm telling you about the truth of God's word. You will be able to recall scripture into your life. It's the Holy Spirit who helps believers keep Christ's commands. And your heart, as you live your life, your heart will be moved to trust and obey Jesus keeping Christ's commands because you love him until the day that he returns. Let's pray. This is a closing prayer poem that I wrote for you. Father, Son, and Spirit, all glory be to God who calls us as his children, who bought us by his blood. You promised us a helper as Christ commands we keep. In loving God and others, we are sealed with joy and peace. Beloved and adopted, we are not left alone. Your presence and your power are gifts to guide us home. Holy Spirit, help us to remember and to see that Jesus is the Son in whom we hope and we believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.